Thanks to all of you who uh, aren't normally in here on Sunday. I'm sorry that you have been dispossessed, and, and uh, we, we, but we thank you that uh, you did uh, come and spend this time with us. We're working through the Psalms. Uh, we're going to be in Psalms 28 and 29 today, if you'd like to, to get there and, uh, and await me joining you. About eight years ago, uh, I had some kind of ailment that I struggled with for a while. It was a gastrointestinal ailment, and I couldn't eat, and and uh, for several weeks, all I could eat was bananas. Um, I didn't think it was too funny, but Phil wrote a song about it. <laughs> and uh, as, the, as the docs were trying to figure out what was going on, they, they gave me a scope down my throat. Uh, and, and when it was done, uh, they can take pictures with those things. just incredible to me. Uh, the doctor showed me a picture that he had taken right inside of my stomach, right just past the esophagus, uh, there was a mass. Uh, I don't like the word tumor. Uh, it was a mass. I don't, it was a mass of what? I don't think it was food, but it was a mass there. And uh, the doctor didn't seem to be alarmed, but he said, that's got to come out of there. We're going to have to go in there and get that thing out. Uh, and apparently it was too big. Uh, uh, Liz, I don't know the whole technology, but it was too big to grab with the little tube that he had, so we're going to have to go in later and get it. So, uh, just a few days later, we had a staff meeting, uh, and I've shared with you, I think, uh, on a number of occasions that I, I particularly love our staff meetings because we don't get together and decide how to run the church. We pray because we learned long ago we can't run the church. So uh, we pray, and it's, it's a very special time, and, and I asked for prayer. I said, look, I'm gonna, they're going to go in there and get that mass, whatever it is, and so I just pray that that turns out well. And, and I didn't expect anything special from that but Dan stopped the request right then and he said I want everybody to come lay their hands on Jack and so the rest of the staff got around and laid their hands on me and and prayed very moving in a very moving manner uh, for for a healing uh, and so just a couple of days later the the doctor went in to get that mass and there was nothing there nothing there now I'm not saying maybe he missed it the first time because I've still got the picture. And he took a picture the second time. There was nothing there. Uh, the doctor was a, a, a strong, I always hate the term strong Christian. I don't, don't know what that means really, but he was a Christian. He was a believer. And he said, doesn't surprise me at all. He says, people have been praying for you, huh? I says, yeah, they have. He says, I see too much of this to think that it's coincidence. Uh, and so I... I guess at that time, more than anything else, I felt the power of prayer in my own life. I've seen it in, in other lives. But let me tell you, that mass was gone. As we go through Psalm 28, I want you to think about that. And uh, we're going to go through 28 and 29 and then come back and talk a little bit about that. But I want you to join me in Psalm 28. The superscript says, of David. So we know that David wrote it. The Holy Spirit inspired him. And this is a prayer. Uh, I'm, I'm going to spend a lot of time on prayer today, but I want you to stop and think about David, who he was, uh, that, that he was indeed a man after God's own heart, and look at the way that he prays. Look at what he said. To you I call, O Lord my rock, do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I will be like those who have gone down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy. That's an interesting prayer. Because he's praying, he knows that God, God hears him, but have you ever seen, a? let me just ask you personally, have you ever seen a remarkable answer to prayer like the one, anybody in medicine I know you have, but in your own life have you seen that? Well, let's flip the page now. Have you ever been at a point in your life when you were praying and you just wonder if anybody was listening? Oh, I'm the only one, huh? You know that feeling, how frustrating it can be? Here's David, and look what he says. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. And then he says something that's really quite remarkable. For if you remain silent, in other words, if you don't respond to this prayer, then I'm going to have to assume that I'm going to be like one of those who've gone down to the pit, those who don't believe in you, those who are not your children. And I don't want to see that because I am. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift up my hands toward your most holy place. So he's approaching the throne of God. 
And it's kind of interesting because as opposed to some of the prayers that I've heard in my life, he's not demanding that God hear it. He's pleading with God to hear it. Please, Lord, find me worthy. There's nothing in and of myself that is, but please find me worthy to hear my prayer because I'm lifting up my hands. We're going to talk about lifting up hands a little bit later. <laughs> do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil, who speak cordially with their neighbors but harbor malice in their thoughts. This was kind of a, he chased an interesting rabbit here. Uh, once again, like last week, he's not necessarily saying, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this sinner over here. But here's what he is saying. He is saying, you know what, these are the types of people that I think don't, you don't hear their prayers if they pray at all. Because their hearts aren't right. They speak cordially to their neighbors, but they have malice in their hearts. Repay them for their deeds and for their evil work. Repay them for what their hands have done and bring back on them what they deserve. Now, he's, this is an imprecatory prayer. Uh, this is one where, and we struggle with that a little bit because that's, uh, that's not golden rulish. You know, we don't want to wish harm on our neighbors. Uh, like Jordan said one Sunday night, you don't want to wish that, that your enemy dies peacefully in his sleep, you know. But here, here David is saying, you know what, I'm praying for justice. These people who are evil people, I want to see them get what they deserve. And, but here's what's interesting about, about David. He doesn't pray, Lord, don't give me what I deserve. He prays the same, Lord, give me what I deserve. Since they show no regard for the work of the Lord and what his hands have done, he will tear them down and never build them up again. He's not, the, the imprecatory prayer is not necessarily that he's just calling for fire and brimstone to rain down on the evil. What he's saying is that I have confidence, Lord, that you are just, that you are fair, and that you're going to treat me fairly just like you're going to treat those who don't obey your laws. Then he kind of takes a turn here, and in the middle of the prayer, he voices confidence that it's going to be heard, that God can do what he says he can do, and that he will hear him. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy, and I will give thanks to him in, th in song. The Lord is the strength of his people, the fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and, care and carry them forever. So look at the form that this prayer carries. He's saying, Lord, please hear me. I am come to you in, in, in earnestness. I come to you in, in humility. And here's what I ask for, mercy. I, I want you to notice he says mercy a couple of times in here. And that's important because he's not asking for justice. Because he knows what he deserves. But he's asking for mercy. Remember who's speaking. This is the king. You know, I say this a lot, but I, I'm always struck by the fact that this is a person who, who could tend to be very egotistical, who could very, be very full of himself and think he deserves things because he is, after all, a man after God's own heart. But this is why he's a man after God's own heart, because he asked for nothing but mercy. And then he expresses full confidence that God will give it to him because God's promised that he will. I want to leave us there and come back and finish the lesson a little bit later with that. So bear with me, if you will. Psalm 29 takes a completely different turn. And I want to kind of set the stage for you because you might have been in a similar circumstance. Um, I, I went on an outing one time with my father-in-law. Bud, you probably remember this. Uh, but we went down to the Frisco River. Uh, and to get there, you have to have four-wheel drive, a jack, and a shovel. And it takes a long time to get down there. And uh, we'd fish and we slept in a tent. And one night came a storm. It was the most incredible storm I think I've ever sat through because I, I wasn't in my bedroom. Uh, you know, I wasn't in my living room. I was in a tent. And when you're in the bottom of a dry wash in New Mexico in a tent, things can get a little dicey. And the lightning show in the desert sky was incredible and it was almost one solid roll of thunder for hours in other words it wasn't just a big crack it was just rumble 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 and lightning was flashing and rain was pouring and and you know you know you've heard before that if you touch the side of the tent and water can get in it really didn't matter because water was just getting in all over the place 
and the, and the tent, I thought it was going to come off the poles. And right after all this started, I got sick. I got really sick. And to put it delicately, I was throwing up and other things. <laughs> and you don't want to be doing that in a tent, right? <laughs> Bud really appreciated that. And so if you're going to be doing this, the only thing to be, place to be doing it is outside. Well, it's raining like crazy. I don't know that I've ever been more miserable in my entire life. But in all, and by the way, he had to drive me out of that dry wash in the middle of the night. I was so sick. But during all that, you can't help but notice the power and the majesty. And why it's magnified when you're out of doors out in the New Mexico wilderness, I don't know. But I was in awe of, of the picture that God painted. David did the same thing in, in, chapter, in, in Psalm 29. So kind of set the stage and watch, at, at, you know, at the risk of quoting Gomer Pyle, I could just say, golly. <laughs> and that's what David's doing in the 29th Psalm. So as he, the 29th Psalm is a praise. It's just a praise to God. Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones. And I hate to stop you with minutia right here, but who is mighty ones? Don't know. Heard a lot of speculation about who that might be. We really think that it's angels. Uh, and I don't know why we would have to tell the angels to praise because that's what they do, because that's what they were created to do. But ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Uh, I'm going to kind of chase a rabbit here just for a minute because I, I hope it helps you appreciate the difficulty in working through the Hebrew. The, your tran Does anybody have a translation in verse 2 other than worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness? Holy array. Holy array. Okay. Uh, the difficulty here is that this is a literal translation of a Hebrew idiom. Uh, we all have, any language has idiomatic speech. It's something that's, that doesn't translate literally. So translated literally, it says in the splendor of his holiness, but likely what it's, talk, what it's referring to is garments. And, and what it's likely referring to is the garments that the priests are supposed to wear when they come before the Lord to do service in the tabernacle. So when it talks about the splendor, he's talking about the splendor of his garments, likely. So it, what does that mean to you? Likely nothing. But I want you to know sometimes the difficulty in any translation, because as I said before, any translation that you get, if you're not reading the Hebrew, uh, is, is a commentary. Because it's that interpreter's commentary on what he thinks the scripture says. Here's the word picture that I love that he, that he paints here. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. Does that sound familiar to you? In Genesis 1, what hovered above the waters? The Spirit hovered above the waters. So here in God's creation, his voice is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. He breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. Uh, that doesn't mean much to us because cedars are just nasty water-sucking trees to us that give you allergies. The cedars of Lebanon were the largest and most impressive uh, trees uh, that anyone in this part of the world had ever seen before. Uh, think of it as redwoods, okay? The mighty redwood, and look what he says. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. He breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. So he's, it's likely, our commentators for centuries have thought, including Charles Haddon Spurgeon, that probably David was inspired by a storm that he saw dance across the Middle East at this time. Uh, and as you look at the geographic postings that we're about to see, uh, it's quite possible that that's what happened. But he's seeing God writing his signature in the sky in lightning. He says, look, he breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf. What does that mean? Better translation is leap. He said, he's shaking 
He is shaking Lebanon. The, the, the very cedars are breaking into pieces. And he's shaking Lebanon like a calf. Sirion, which is uh, Mount Hermon, uh, which is right on the border between Lebanon and Syria as, as we know it now. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf. Sirion like a young wild ox. Um, if you've ever seen a, a calf, have you ever seen a calf dance? Okay, you know what I'm talking about? That's, the mountain shaking like that must have been an incredible storm. And so he sees the storm pass over Lebanon and into Syria. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. Now Kadesh is in Syria. So we've got this storm that has passed from east to west from Lebanon over into Syria. And as David's watching this off in the, off in the distance, he's got to marvel at, at what the power of God who could write that thing across the sky. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. I don't know how many of you just watched the news this last week about a, a couple of tornadoes set down briefly. But did you see the one in, in Bertram where it actually picked up a house and, and they said that house was so well constructed that it literally picked it up off the foundation, off the piers, and moved it about 100 yards. The house was still, for the most part, intact. But think about the power that it takes to strip an entire home from its moorings and move it 100 yards. That's what David was watching. And that's what, when, he, when he said, you know what, it twists the oaks and strips the forest bare, all in his temple, all cry glory. I want you to stop and think about that. Uh, we read about God uh, in, in, in his home, in, in heaven, uh, and how we, how the heavenly host, how the angels, how we're going to react in the future. What will we spend eternity doing when we're there? Praising him. Praising him. And even in the midst of this storm, all in the temple, the, 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 the seraphim, you know, the, the angels, what are they doing? They're crying glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. He is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. I hope that gives you an insight into the heart of, of a man that is described as a man after God's own heart. Because he can sit and watch the storm dance across the Middle East over in the horizon and do pretty much what I did that night up on the Frisco River And when all you can say is, golly, he's just a little more eloquent about it. And I, have you, one of the last things we did before we left New Mexico is to watch a sunset. And they're about as pretty as they get there and think, you know, God painted that. What a mighty God we serve. Back to Psalm 28. Verses 1 and 2. To you I call, O Lord, my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I will be like those who have gone down to the pit. One of the things that I spend... Uh, a significant amount of time talking to people about is knowing God's will. They want to talk to a pastor about that. And quite often people say, it seems like my prayers never get past the ceiling. We, we mentioned earlier, we, we've all felt that, I think, at one time or another. And I want you to know that God answered my prayer for healing in an obvious and miraculous way. But sometimes it seems like God goes silent. And what I love about David is that he is brutally honest in his psalms. I think that's one of the reasons God loved David so much. He was just brutally honest. And he said that if God didn't answer, it was his own fault. It was, it was David's fault. He said, if, if God's not answering, it's his own fault. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit now and talk about cell phone reception. Uh, Karen and I spent a, a frustrating afternoon not long back trying to talk to each other on the cell phone. And, and you know, finally I said, talk quick. Because <laughs> I know we'll get, and then she'd talk, said something like that, that, one of those conversations. 
And so when we were over at the, the Terry's house, and what I found is that if you walk out the front door and get right by the first column of the, first, the front porch and you lean against it and raise your leg like this, <laughs> You actually get some reception. Have you ever been somewhere where you say, well, I got to wait. I got to go where I, in, in, in the church here, right? And need the cell phone reception is kind of bad back there. And it's funny because someone in the office will get a phone call and you'll see them sprinting for the front door and running outside. A little bit because you don't want people to listen to your conversation, but you got to get some reception. Have you ever done that? You got to get cell phone reception. I want you to think sometimes of, of prayer in that same vein. I don't, and I know it sounds a little, a little strange right now, but kind of follow me, and I think it'll, it'll clear up a little bit. And I would just like to offer a couple of things that, that, that I've read from pastors that I really appreciate, that if it ever appears that God isn't answering, and, and let me just give you a caveat in there too. Uh, sometimes it, you say, God isn't answering my prayer. Oh, he's answering, you just don't want to hear it. I find that a lot, find that in, in my own life. He's answered, you know, you just, isn't there another possibility, God, you know? Uh, sometimes his, his answer uh, is wait, and we don't like that answer either. But I realize that sometimes it seems like your prayers, your prayers just go out into space, and he's not answering, and there are a few things you might consider. Um, the first is that it could be because of wrong thinking. And I think that David is not guilty of this. And, and, and here's the, the wrong thinking. Uh, not being earnest. I'm going to say this as gently as I can, and you know I'm about to get myself in trouble, don't you? Okay. Um, I think too often we rely on prayer formulas. Kind of bear with me on, on, on prayer formulas. Um, have you been in places where we say, okay, let's get together for a prayer meeting, uh, and we'll all pray. Everybody will pray. And if you're a Baptist, you always pray clockwise. <laughs> right? You do. You, you always pray clockwise. And some person will pray all the things they can think about to pray, and we've all got our heads down. And I'm not really praying because I'm trying to think of something to say. And, and, then, I, and then I say, Oh, Gary, Gary's praying before me. Gary got my stuff. You know, Gary prayed for stuff I wanted to pray for. Uh, and so you've got a whole list, as, and if you're last, you know all your stuff's going to get picked off. You know, before, and so you're, you've got to have a whole list of stuff. Uh, and we make little mini speeches. I've, I've had people bring God up to date on their speech, like he didn't know what was happening, you know. And, and so it becomes a ritual. And, and I don't really mean to make light of that because I know we do it in all seriousness. But one time, Dan said, let's, let's change the way we pray in our staff meetings. And it energized, revitalized our prayer life and, and changed everything about the way we prayed. And he said, let's have a conversation with God. And let's don't have speeches to God and, and make it brief. Say, God, here's, here's what's on my heart. I'm praying for so-and-so. You don't have to describe the procedure they just went through. God knows it. I'm praying for so-and-so. He knows your heart. Uh, even language, and, and this sounds a little funny too, because the, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't think God heard it unless it was thee and thou and thine. And, and uh, we don't speak that way, and so generally we mangle King James because we don't know how to speak it. Um, and, and so that was another, uh, or even the way we do it. Uh, because over, over years, prayer has been like this, it has been like this, it has been prostrate on the floor, uh, even a position. Uh, and, and too often, we concern ourselves more with the form than we do the function. And it all starts right here. It all starts inside, and God knows who we are. And, and I found myself kind of revitalized in my own prayer life, having conversations with God. Thank thee, God, for thine providence. Okay, if that makes you feel better, but, you know, say, gee, thanks, Lord. That works too. He knows your heart, and that's where it begins. So what comes out and the form that it takes and where you are and how you're standing really isn't that important. And David knew that. 
Here's, here's an, another piece, and, th- and this is wrong thinking. I think the biggest barrier is praying for our will rather than God's. And I see that all the time. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with asking directly for something. But in the model prayer, and I, I really don't like to call it the Lord's Prayer. I like to call it the model prayer. Uh, when he said something about, uh, Lord, I want it my way, or was it thy will be done? Whose will? When Jesus taught us, when the, when the disciples said, teach us how to pray, that's what he taught them. That you pray in God's will. And, and Scripture's full of that fact that we need to pray in God's will. Ironically, it seems like most prayers are done strictly in our will. And, and we give God a laundry list. Here's what I want, Lord. Here's what I want. James 4, 3 says this. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. Whoa. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Stop and think about that. Any, any prosperity gospel folks in here? Praying that God gives you Cadillac is just so bad on so many levels. Lord, I want your will for my life. That's very simple. No problem with asking specifically for something, but you always ought to tie it to one thing. What's that? I want to pray for your will. But it's not too much to ask. That's okay. Here's something else that that I've been guilty of. Uh, praying without believing. Have you ever prayed a well, it wouldn't hurt prayer? <laughs> well, nothing else to do, it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> I've had people say that actually. What, shall we pray? Yeah, it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> hmm, boy, that kind of overwhelms God. <laughs> James 1, uh, verses 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. So this, you know, you've heard winging a prayer or wishing a prayer. Well, it wouldn't hurt, you know. What are, you going to, what are you going to accomplish with that? Because where does God look? He looks on your heart and he knows what you're praying and why you're praying and how you're praying. And if you're thinking, well, you know, the chances aren't one in a million that this is going to work out, but it sure wouldn't hurt to cover my bases. That's powerful. Let me tell you, I had five people lay their hands on me and pray that, that a mass would be healed firm in the conviction that if God wanted to do it, he'd do it. That he could do it. Doesn't mean he had to. He was not bound to. But they were firm in the belief that he could do it. In just a few short verses, David declared three reasons why God should answer his prayers. And I want you to stop and think about this. And I like to try to apply it to my own life. Here's what he said. First, I come to you in humbleness asking for mercy. I come to you in humility asking for mercy. Do I have any standing to demand anything of you? No. Do I have any right to ask anything of you? No. You heard Dan's message this morning. What's my righteousness? Filthy rags. And that's how David came to God. I come to you asking for mercy. The second thing was kind of interesting. My enemies don't respect you like I do. So when I come to you for mercy, I want you to know this. I believe that you will answer my prayer. And I believe that you want what's best for me. I might not always understand it. And the third thing is this. I kind of like this. And, and if David were here today, I think he'd say it something like this. Hey, I'm one of your people. You're an anointed one. And I could really use some help down here. And I think that's how I'm trying to pattern my own prayers here. Say, Lord, I could use a lot of help. One of the things that we did this, this year that 
we didn't emphasize, I think, as much as we should have, um, but, but I want to really emphasize it more next year, and that's that we had a group of uh, an army of prayer volunteers, prayer warriors, who were given names for whom they were to pray. They were given these names. Um, talked to Priscilla before the class, and she told me about, about that she had prayed this last week. And I had just told her that I had never seen a Camp Crestview. This is my 13th. Uh, do you get credit for two when there's two weeks? So this is about 25 now. Okay. Um, the, but I've never seen a camp where I saw as much evidence of the Holy Spirit moving. Cheryl had, uh, what, 12 out of 13 of her kids come down and make, make professions of faith. I, and I saw a spirit among the kids, a spirit among the, the workers that I just haven't seen before. Um, and I could say, well, it's, it's lucky it's been a great year. I don't think so. I think we had an army of people praying for that. You know, Pringles cans are fine. <laughs> Cookies are great. But prayer, wow, wow. So if, if I look at, at David's pattern and say, if we truly approach him in humility and expect that he can deliver what's best for us and ask for his will to be done, that's the best way to start. And when we do that for Camp Crestview for week two, hide and watch what's going to happen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your speaking through a king so many years ago, words that are so applicable for us today. I thank you for these who come to study that word, and I pray, Lord, that it would flower in their lives, that the time that we spend in prayer with you be earnest, and that we pray, Father, for your will to be done in our lives, and your will to be done in Camp Crestview, and that you use us in any way you can. As we go our separate ways today, please help us to remember that we are, as always, people sharing Jesus. Amen. Please find someone you don't know and say hello to them.